Judge gasoline value. No longer is it sufficient for you to demand the gasoline that delivers only better mileage or merely quick starting or just power. You should demand police car performance, which includes all these qualities and many more. Do you realize that a police car is required to give seven times the dependable service that you demand from your own car? The average Los Angeles police car, for example, travels an average of 78,840 miles per year. What a test for gasoline. Cracked gasoline fulfills these rigid requirements. For in the great southwest, it powers more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other equipment than all other brands combined. When you next buy gasoline, you get police car performance for your car. And that means... Rio Grande Crack with Tetra Ethel. It is usual at this time to present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. But unfortunately, Chief Davis has not been able to appear for the opening of this program. But we shall hear him, hear from him at the close of the program. We present the Nitroglycerin Parson. <laughs> the year of the war. Across the nation spreads the hysteria of patriotism that sends farmer and mechanic, capitalist and worker, believer and unbeliever, swinging into our drab, tramping down the main streets of the nation to the measure of a stirring march. In a little white church in San Diego, the Reverend Herbert Wilson also hears the distant strains of patriotic music, feels the call to serve his fellow men at the front. In a stirring farewell, he promises his parents that he will care for their boys in war as he has cared for them in peace. That night, accompanied by his brother Louis, the Reverend Wilson boards an eastbound limited. In the club car, Louis compliments his brother on his last appearance in the pulpit. Well, Herb, you certainly made him weep in church today. You've got a gift of gab, you have. Yes, I suppose I have. And they all believe it. Didn't you? Did you? Well, no, but then some singing isn't my line. I'm just the black sheep of the family. Sometimes I envy you that, Louis. What? Being the black sheep of the family. It's talking about her. What's got into you? I don't know. I'm sure I don't. Look here. You don't suppose it's much fun being a minister, do you? No, of course not. I'm not built that way, but a Bible pounder like you, why, that's your meat. I wonder. Look here, Louis. You think I'm going to join up as a chaplain, don't you? 
Sure, that's what you told the customers, wasn't it? Yes, that's what I told the parish. But I'm not going to do it. I'm going to see some excitement and have some fun. I'm going to enlist in the infantry. I'm going to quit being a parson for a while. And I'm going to be just plain Herb Wilson. I... I'm sick of baptizing babies and praying over corpses, and I'm tired of shouting the word of God and the Holy Bible when I don't believe a word of it. I, I... Do you know what you're saying? Let's get into it. I don't know, Louis. There is something wrong. I'm losing faith. I don't believe anymore. And, Louis, the strange thing is, it doesn't worry me a bit. You mean that? Yes, I'm sure I do. And you want excitement? Yes, do we? Yes. And you want to be a black sheep? Yes. How would you like to do all that and make some money at the same time? What do you mean? Never mind what I mean, only we're stopping off at Toledo to see a friend of mine. I to meet my brother, Herb. Uh, glad to know you, Herb. Yeah, thanks, and I'm glad to make your acquaintance, Mr. Harris. You know, Herb, uh, Harris here is one of the best Peter men in the country. Peter men? Uh, what's the Peter man? <laughs> oh, that's a hard one. Louis Wilson's brother doesn't know what a Peter man is. <laughs> well, you, well, you see, Harris, uh, Herb's a preacher. Oh, a preacher. Yeah, yeah, but he's sick of it. He told me he wants some excitement, and I, I figured that he'd get more of it traveling with us than he would going to war. Yeah, but, Louis, you haven't told me yet what a Peter man is. Well, Herb, a Peter man is a safe cracker. A safe cracker? Louis, you don't need to tell me that Well, you... Herb, you, you can't really clean up making an honest living these days. Yes, I know, but a common burglar, my own brother. Oh, don't take it so hard, Herb. It's more fun and pays better than peddling a gospel. Well, I don't know what to say. I'm shocked. Shocked beyond words. Well, you don't need to say anything. Just listen to me. In a couple more years, I'll have a million dollars. I'll be able to retire from this business and settle down. Would you ever make a million dollars in the religion business? A million dollars. A million dollars. <laughs> His brother and Harris draw an enticing picture of the life of a cracksman. And eventually, Herb is convinced that a career of crime has manifold advantages. After much discussion, Herb is won over. Well, it sounds like good business to me. Well, it is. How about it, Herb? You want to join up with us? Yes, I think I do. But first, I want to go into this thing thoroughly. Now, you say that you crack these steaks with soup. Uh, or rather, a nitroglycerin? Yeah, that's right. Hmm, an explosive powerful enough to blow a safe must uh, make some noise, doesn't it? Oh, sure. Well, that ought to be eliminated. Eliminated? How the devil could you take a bang out of nitroglycerin? I don't know, but you boys should if you work with it. Uh, what are you getting at? We use it just the way it comes. Well, then you aren't doing a thorough job. Well, we ain't doing so bad. Maybe not. But I believe in knowing all about my tools before I use them. Now, take acetylene torches, for instance. What's the best type? No, I don't know anything about types. When I want to cut through a safe, I use a torch, that's all. Well, before I go into this business, I'm going to find out these things. Who's going to teach you? I don't know. But I'm going to find out. With the application that made him a brilliant preacher, Herb Wilson sets out to be a brilliant criminal. He attends an industrial school in Detroit and takes a course in the operation of acetylene torches. He works in a safe factory in Ohio, acquainting himself with all the details of the construction of strong boxes. And then to complete his education, he travels to Washington and spends days in the Bureau of Standards, studying the chemistry of high explosives and inspecting burglar alarms. His self-conferred degree in safe cracking earned, he returns to Detroit and summons his brother, Harris, Joe Bertke and Herbert Cox to his apartment. Boys, I told you I'd go and I'd find out all I could about this business of breaking boxes. Well, I have. I've studied every type of safe made in the United States. I know how to put any burglar alarm that buzzes out of commission. 
And I've worked out a formula for a new nitroglycerin that just pushes safe doors out without making any explosion at all. And I've got the finest acetylene torch there is, made especially for me. And now I'm ready to begin work. How about it? You boys want to work with me? Sure. Yeah, my golly, that sounds good to me. That's fine. But there's one condition, though. Huh? What's that work? I'm the boss. You take your orders from me. Is that understood? Yeah. Yeah, Sure. Sure, that's okay. All right, then. I've got a swell mark picked out. We're going to break into the headquarters of Kroger Brothers, the big chain grocers. Kroger Brothers? Well, you must be crazy, eh? Hey? Why, that case is absolutely totally fool. Yeah? yeah? Sure, huh? But foolish to tackle such a big job at first. Well, I see you boys aren't interested. Oh, no, it's not that uh, one. It's just a ticket to the pen. But you're picking too big a job. I said that I am giving the orders. Now, if there's any argument... I can get myself another bunch of men just as good as you fellows. Oh, don't get sore. Oh, we'll play ball with you. Well, that's better. Now, here's the reason that they're going to pull a big job for a starter. As a rule, the big ones are not so well guarded. Why, Kroger's has only two watchmen inside and a man patrolling the street outside. Well, it's an awful risk, Herb. Of course it's a risk, but it's worth it to get a big haul, isn't it? Kroger's safe has a reputation for being burglar proof. Well, let me tell you this. There isn't a safe made that's burglar proof. And just you wait and see what I do with that box Thursday night. On Thursday night, a big Packard sedan creeps through the shadows of the alley behind Kroger's store. It stops beside a manhole, and several men get out of it. Here. Here. Hoist this manhole cover. This is our entrance to the place. Okay, give me that flashlight. I'll go in first. Hey, Herb, you sure you want me to lug this screen along? Yes, sir. We're going to need that. Come on, let's get in the place. Thank God it's dark in here. Wait a minute. Now, don't worry. You follow me and you won't trip over anything. Uh, you know where you're going, Herb? Do I know where I'm going? Of course I do. Well, where are we now? Well, we're in the basement of the building. Quiet now. One of the watchmen is due to come by here in a minute. Here he comes now. Pick him up and make it fast. Uh, what's the quiet, quiet. Frisk him, Louis. Yeah. Here's his key. Flashlight. And here's his gas. Uh, good. Now, Louis, you keep your gun on him. And Cox, he looks about your size. You strip him and put on his uniform. And then you keep making his rounds and punching the Cox so they won't get wise that anything's wrong. Okay. Come on, Joe. We're going to get to that safe. You take that screen. Well, I'll meet you when I'm through here. The officer's at the head of these stairs. Come up there. Oh, please. Well, here we are, Joe. My God. How are you going to walk on that box? Anyone can see right in through the window, sir. Well, now, just you watch. Here, hand me that screen. First, we got to unroll it. That's good. There. Now we fasten these supports at either end. Here we are. And then we set it up. There, how's that? A feature of the safe. That's right. Anyone looking into this dark room from the outside will think it's the real safe. And all the time we'll be working behind it. <laughs> Pretty smart, Herb. Well, I try to think of everything. Now you get busy and short those burglar alarms while I'm laying out my stuff. This burglar proof of box is going to be a cinch. <laughs> While Wilson works swiftly and surely upon the safe, Louie and Cox hold up and trust the other watchman. And then Cox, in the watchman's uniform, continues the round where the unfortunate guard had left off. All the time Cox punched, Cox joins his companions in the office. Wilson has filled the crack around the door of the safe with soft soap, making the safe perfectly airtight. Then in a hole in the soap at the top of the door, he carefully pours nitroglycerin from a syringe. A detonating cap is placed at the bottom of the soap crack, and positive and negative wires are run from it across the room to a small flashlight battery. At last, all is in readiness. Okay, boys. Watch yourself. Here she goes. Hey, Herb, wait a minute. What's the matter? That watchman on the outside coming his way. Hey, we can't let him see us. Quick, Cox, you've got that uniform on. Do something. Get out there. Let him see you. Uh, He's coming closer to the window. Wave to him, Cox. Wave to him. And don't get in the light from that street lamp. Uh, uh, He's waving back. He's walking on. Boy, that was a close shave. Don't ever tell me to do anything like that again. 
I thought I'd die a heart failure when that bird came over to the window. Well, they're okay now. Wait a minute. I need a shot of this next with this one. Hey, you're not taking a drink of that stuff, are you? You bet I am. It's a great stimulant, and I need it. There, that's good. Well, that watchman won't be around this way for a half an hour. And we'll be out of here by that time. Now, well, hang on, boys. She's going this time. All set? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. She is swinging on the hinge and hardly made a sound. Herb, I've got to take my hat off to you. Come on. Let's see what's in it. Wait till I get that inside door open. Well, there you are, boys. Okay. Must be a hundred grand in there. Not bad. Not bad. Yeah, but there's a lot of liberty bonds here. Yeah? Well, what can we get for them? Only about 10% of their face value. Even so, we got a nice piece of change here for one night's work. Well, how about it, huh? Doesn't this beat Sky Paladin? It sure does, Louis. <laughs> Technique, a proved success after the Kroger job, Wilson goes on an orgy of safe cracking, culminating a week later when he and the mob break open nine safes in one Detroit office building on the same night. The police are frantic, and while they fume, Wilson and his pal laugh in their apartment hideaway. <laughs> Say, boys, this is the funniest thing in a month or Sunday. What's that, Herb? Why, this newspaper story. Listen, just get a load of this. The largest police drag net in the history of the city of Detroit was ordered today by the chief of police following the crime wave in the Stratton building last night, when nine safes were broken open and cash and securities valued at hundreds of thousands of dollars were stolen. The police are arresting all robbery suspects and rounding up all suspicious characters in an effort to apprehend the criminals. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good that will do them, rounding up suspects. Right, because we aren't suspects. I wouldn't have anyone working with me that has a police record. You sure take more care than any Peter man I ever saw. Uh, you're right, I do, and it pays, doesn't it? Why, the way we work without leaving the slightest clue, not even a fingerprint say. We'll be on easy street and out of the business before anyone knows we're in it. Yeah, but we can't be retired this minute, and we're always taking a chance, you know. Yeah, that's right, but boys, I've got a job planned that'll get us out of this business forever. Yeah? Yeah, what is it, Ed? Well, there's a fortune in the safe of the Maccabees National Headquarters in this town. The Maccabees? Oh, you're crazy, Herb. Nobody can break that ball. Yeah, that's what you say. Why, there isn't a Peterman in the country that would even try it. You're wrong there, Cox. Here's one. An awful chance. Not so awful as you think. I'm going to take plenty of time on the build-up, and when everything's set, he'll just walk in there and break that box. But, Herb, that says bit like a battle. Yeah? And there isn't an armor plate made that my acetylene torch won't cut through. Oh, I'm going to use a torch on it. Yes, sir, we're going to do this right. It'll take time, but it's worth it. And it'll be our last job. Our last job? What do you mean, Herb? Well, we can all retire afterwards. Yeah? How come? How come? Because there's $13 million in that safe. Long weeks of preparation are spent on the Maccabee job. One of the gang makes friends with the night watchman at the organization's headquarters and learns from him the details of the layout. Plans are made down to the last detail for the destruction of burglar alarms. And dollars are obtained on which to transport the acetylene tanks into the office. Finally, on the Saturday night, everything is in readiness. One by one, the guards are overpowered and locked up in closets. One by one, the 13 burglar alarm boxes are put out of commission. Then, all precautions taken, Wilson unwraps his equipment. The gas tank is wheeled in. And donning an asbestos apron of his own invention... The nitroglycerin carton lights his torch and sets the work on the master's face. Like a knife, through cheese, the hissing blue flame of the torch cuts through the thick steel box. Deeper, deeper as the hours of the night wheel on. Closer, closer to a tremendous fortune. The members of the gang crouch around the leader, watching with eyes gleaming with avarice as the hooded figure of the monster cracks and bends over his work. Finally, toward dawn, Wilson raises his hooded head. Well... Only another quarter of an inch to go, boys. Oh, hurry up, Puff. It's getting late. Well, it's just a matter of a few seconds, and then... Thirteen million dollars. Yes, sir. Uh, hey. Hey, what the... Uh, uh, what's his loss? I don't know. Where did I get this knife for? Wait a minute. I want to take a look at that tank. Well, that's that, boys. We're out of gas. Out of gas? 
but a quarter of an inch away from $13 million. Quiet, quiet. Well, that's the way it stands. Yeah. What are we going to do? Well, what can we do? We can't get a gas any place at 3 a.m. on Sunday morning. We could use light on it. Yeah, if we had any. Oh, that's right. We didn't bring any with us. Well, it won't do any good crying about it. We've got to take it on the lamb right now, boys. Come on. In the whole of Wilson's career of crime, during which he stole more than $15 million from scores of states and mail bags, this is the only failure. Disgusted, he goes to New York. And through a friend who is an intimate of social register rights, he steals a fortune in jewels from the Fifth Avenue home of Mrs. Charlotte Palmer. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, he blows the safe of Harvard University after having obtained the layout by posing as a student. Starting west once more, he meets a group of foreigners who are interested in buying some of his nitroglycerin. After tests which convince them that it's the most powerful explosive obtainable, they purchase 30 quarts explaining that they wanted to blow up some rival vineyards. Wilson never knows until after his arrest that this nitroglycerin of his own manufacture was the explosive used in the Wall Street bombing in 1920 that cost the lives of 39 men and women. Wilson is spending a few days in Detroit in December 1920 when he receives a wire from his Confederates that there is a soft mark in San Francisco. He loses no time in boarding a westbound train, and a few days later, he's going over details with his men. The mark is Tail Brothers Department Store. Already, the gang has planted a girl confederate at the hosiery counter of the store. And already, one of their number, posing as a census taker, has gained the confidence of the night watchman and learned the details of the burglar alarm system. On the night of December the 5th, Wilson and his gang force their way into the place, and quickly subduing the guards, they dash up to the cashier's office on the fourth floor. Wilson goes to work on the safe. And soon the huge door swings open under the persuasive power of his special nitroglycerin. There remains only a steel partition within the safe that must be drilled with Wilson's motor drill. Herb steps inside the safe to finish the job. Herb, look out. What's the matter? Some wire mat in front of the door. Looks like an alarm to me. Yeah, that was a close one. Let me see. Yeah, I guess you're right, Cox. You better go ahead and short it out. And I'll collect up the motor while you're at it. Okay. There's a light talking up there over your head. Where? Oh, yes, I see I'll just unscrew this bulb here and plug in the motor, and then we're all set. Yeah, this one's simple. Well, have you got it right? Sure thing. You can go ahead now. It won't be long. And it wasn't long. The loot from the Hale Brothers department store in San Francisco amounted to $100,000. Leafly, the mob leaves San Francisco by different trains. And a few days later, join their chief in Los Angeles, where the loot is divided. Wilson and the gang settle down in Los Angeles, and Wilson buys several apartment houses and homes. His legitimate income from his investments is nearly $4,000 a month. And in safe deposit boxes from coast to coast, he has nearly a million dollars in cash. But the lure of excitement is always with him. He cannot retire from his career of safe cracking. So it is that when seated in a dentist's chair one day, and seeing a safe directly across the street in the Fifth Street department store... He cannot overlook the possibility of cracking. After visiting the cashier's office in the store on a fake errand, he calls Cox and tells him about it. And that evening, he and Louis Wilson and Cox are discussing the layout at their Manhattan Beach hideaway when Cox's little son runs into the house. Now, boys, it's an old box, and it'll be a cinch to break. Now, you enter from the alley, and here in the diagram is this. Jimmy, look where I am. Uh, we're busy now, Jimmy. You'd better show it to your mother. But look, Danny, we're going to free policemen. Uh, what's that? Yeah. What have you got there? A swell star. Look. A deputy sheriff's badge. Where did you get it? I found it on the beach. On the beach, eh? Well, uh, you better go on out and play, son. Oh, let me have the badge, Daddy. Not now, Jimmy. I'll give it to you later. I want to look at it. Oh, hey. Here, Jimmy, here's a dime. Go on out and get yourself some ice cream. Oh, okay, Dad. Then can I play with the badge after? Yes, Jimmy, after. Go on now, beat it. All right, Dad. Go on. <laughs> You suppose this has been planted on its head? No, I don't think so. It looks okay to me. If you ask me, it's a swell break. We can use it on this next job. The deputy sheriff's badge does come in handy when the Wilson gang blows up the safe in the Fifth Street department store. But the master criminal seems to be slipping. At least he's getting careless. For he drops the badge at the scene of the crime. Through this clue, a police investigation starts, which takes months, months, during which Wilson has taken to robbing the mail. 
But an investigation that through Cox's son, who had found the badge, leads to Cox himself and from Cox's confession to Wilson. It is early morning, two days before Christmas in 1921. The peaceful sleep of Mrs. Wilson, faithful, innocent, unsuspecting wife of the arch criminal, is disturbed. She raises on her elbow, shakes her husband. Herbert. Herbert. Huh? What, uh, what's the matter, dear? Herbert, I heard someone downstairs. Who's the Oh, is. you're hearing things, my dear. No, I'm sure. Yes. You're right. There is someone down there. Uh, where's that gun of mine? There in the drawer. Oh, be careful, Herbert, please. Of course, my dear. Who's there? Come on down, you. I want to have a little talk with you. Who is it? What do you want? Come along, make it snappy. Uh, stay up there, Sarah. Stay up there. No, I'm going to see what you want. Get on the light, Joe. Got that gun, Wilson. Say, what is this? You're under arrest by the United States government. Why, my husband under arrest? What for? We'll talk about that later, ma'am. Now drop that gun, Wilson. Uh, why, certainly. I, I just have it as protection against uh, burglars. Oh, yeah? Well, hand it over. Uh, certainly, there you are. And now may I ask the purpose of this uninvited visit? This is not a social call. I've already told you you're under arrest. Well, there must be some mistake. My husband is a retired clergyman. Maybe that's what you think, ma'am. But that isn't all he is. We didn't come to arrest the Reverend Herbert Wilson, retired clergyman. We are here to get Herb Wilson, mail robber. Mail robber? Herbert, what are you talking yes, about? Sarah, I, no, you and I better take a look through the second floor. Say, Wilson, where do you keep your soup? Soup? Why, if there's any in the house, it must be in the pantry. Why? Are you hungry? Uh, Sarah, uh, get the gentleman some Come soup. on, Wilson. That's a bum joke. That soup of yours killed 39 people in that Wall Street bombing last year. Herbert. Now, I assure you, there's some mistake. No mistakes on our part, Wilson. You're the one that made the mistake. Mistake number one was when you left your fingerprint on that light bulb in the Hale Brothers department store hold up last December. Mistake number two was when you dropped that deputy sheriff's badge while you were holding up the Fifth Street department store. And mistake number three was working with a pal like Cox. Who just squealed on you. So he squealed a dirty oh, I can't believe it. From all these years, I, I never knew. I believed all that you told me about the investment. From all these years, I, I've been living with a thief. I didn't want you to know, Sarah. I was going to go straight. Honestly, I was. I just wanted to provide for you, dear. A thief. My husband. Nothing but a common... Not a common thief, ma'am. A mighty clever one. He's the best in the business. Or rather, he was the best in the business. Wilson was a hard prisoner to handle. He plotted one jailbreak in which his partner Cox was killed. Then he planned another, which was successful but which resulted in liberty for him only overnight. Finally, he was tried and sent to San Quentin for life. Six times after his incarceration in the state penitentiary, he was taken out to testify for the state against one-time members of his gang, with the result that every one of his confederates are either now serving time or have met violent death. <laughs> your car. Steep mountain grade. The temperature gauge creeps up and up. Look out. That may mean a huge repair bill. But you can avoid this grease by perfect lubrication. You can buy oil for a few cents. But it will be of little value to your motor. You should use a motor oil that is both de-waxed and de-jelly. Such an oil is Sinclair Opaline. Why gamble with ordinary bulk oil when you can buy a Sinclair Opaline for only 25 cents a quart, sold only in extra measure, tamper-proof can, sealed at the refinery? You'll find it low-cost insurance of your motor safety. The new radio log for August is now available, containing a complete list of forthcoming cases to be broadcast on Calling All Cars and another Rio Grande radio program. Drive into your neighborhood Rio Grande service station tomorrow and ask for the August radio log. It's free. What color is the police calling?
Attention all cars, attention all cars. Cancellation broadcast 36 regarding a safe cracking. Suspects in this case now in custody. That's all. Rolls and quotes. Ladies and gentlemen, we regret very much that Chief Davis was unable to appear tonight on this program. But he will be with us next week at this time. Calling All Cars is based on confidential police files and is written and produced by William N. Robeson. The orchestra is under the direction of Freddie Stark. And this is Frederick Lindsley saying good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company. <laughs>